va, va a presentarnos, bueno, va, tenemos una noche de Night Hacking. Eh, ha traído, un, como veréis, las mesas están llenas de, de gadgets, de cacharros y de cosas interesantes. Y, bueno, sobre lo que nos va, nos va a hablar, ahora se presentará el mismo. Gracias a la gente de Madrid, Java, que está también por aquí, que, bueno, ha hecho esto también posible. Para los que no habéis venido antes a Make Space, eh, Make Space es un espacio que nos hemos juntado a una comunidad de personas para montar un sitio relacionado con fabricación digital y poder lanzar proyectos que tengan una parte de hardware, que, que consideramos bastante importante, o que tengan que ver con fabricación digital, electrónica, programación, pero no solo eso, sino que también pensamos que es un sitio en el que la gente se encuentra con otra gente que tiene buenas ideas y bueno, pues puede sacarlas adelante de una forma más interesante. Y bueno, el espacio, este es el... el la parte de arriba del espacio, la parte de abajo no la estamos usando de momento. Tenemos aquí la zona donde vamos a hacer el taller, un, ta un taller de electrónica cerca de la entrada, una zona de fabricación digital con máquinas de escaneo y de impresión 3D, un taller tradicional y aquí tenemos una máquina de corte láser y fresado para poder hacer prototipos, para hacer diseños. Estoy muy contento porque tenemos una fresadora que no funcionaba hasta ayer, ya funciona. Bien. Y, y nada, pues ha venido gente también de León, del Fabla de León, aquí a hacernos una visita, está estupendo, ha venido un montón de gente. Y nada más, si estáis interesados en, en saber más sobre Make Space, pues bueno, hay muchos, soy el único que tiene la camiseta, pero hay muchas más personas por aquí de Make Space. Y nada, la idea de, del espacio también es que lo sostenemos entre la gente que somos, que la gente dice, pero esto de quién es, esto de, pues esto es del dueño, ¿sabes? O sea, lo alquilamos como si fuéramos los, los arrendatarios, nunca mejor dicho. Y nada más, voy a, voy a cambiar inglés, así se entera también de lo que estamos contando y, y arrancamos ya, ¿vale? Veo pocos portátiles, yo esperaba más Night Hacking, veía más, pero bueno, vamos a ver qué cuenta. Okay, so I switch to English. Um, yep. Welcome to MakeSpace. MakeSpace was founded like one year ago. Uh, our uh, main concern is that we travel all around and see hack spaces, make spaces, fab lab, and when we travel back to Madrid, there was none. So we said, okay, if there, no one's doing it, let's do it. And we started that like one year ago. Indeed, next Tuesday afternoon, it's our first anniversary. It's open doors, so you're welcome to come here. And, and well, the, the idea of the space is to be a meeting space where people can develop their own projects, where they can make their ideas come true using digital fabrication tool, electronic equipment, and coding. But it's not just the machines or the code, but it's also a community of people that love to go, love to do stuff, and love to make things. And it's a real pleasure to have uh, Stephen here. He's going to to present a lot of stuff on the Nike Hacker theme. And well, welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, so um, my name's Stephen Chen. Um, apologies, but well, I don't need that, because I have. Yeah, I have. Okay, there. Now, now you guys, you guys are on the screen, not me. <laughs> so, um, my name is Steven Chin. I'm a technology ambassador for Oracle, um, and I brought lots of devices and things to to show you as examples of um, Java running on different devices. Um, I even have hardware that we can hack on if you guys are interested. Um, and I'm doing a crazy motorcycle tour across. Europe. So this is the Night Hacking website. Um, you can see that our, our stream is actually live. There's, there's you on the stream, Caesar. Um, and then we have a Twitter feed which shows what's currently being um, tweeted. If you tweet anything with a hashtag Night Hacking, it goes straight out over the, um, over the live stream. What did I say? Okay, I was wondering why my levels were so low and yours were so high with the microphone. There, that should be more equitable. 
Um, and I'm doing a motorcycle tour across Europe. So this is the tour page. Um, you can track where I am real time. So I'm at Make Space Madrid. Um, if you were watching this earlier today, you would have seen me coming, driving up from Santander, where I spoke last night. Here's a list of the remaining stops on the tour. So I'm going to be headed to um, Sevilla tomorrow, um, Lisbon after that, then back to Barcelona. And um, the final stop in Europe is Devox, France, before I go back and fly over to India for some additional events there. Um, no motorcycle in India. <laughs> And then you can see some of the additional events down here. Um, so we're live streaming everything. Um, if folks are on the live stream, they can interact by, via Twitter, or there's also a um, um, IRC channel open as well if they want to comment or say anything. Um, so what I was thinking for agenda today is maybe we can do some introductions here for the folks who are present. Um, then I'll, I'll demonstrate some of the toys and things which I have. Um, and then if we have time left over, we can hack and build some new stuff. Sound good? Yeah. Okay, so microphone, hold it about you know this far away from your face. Say hi for the folks on the stream. Well, oh, and hold on just a sec. I have to switch inputs. Whatever you see up here is exactly what's getting broadcast out over the live stream. So now, now to you. Well, I'm Abraham Otero from Java Hispano. And Manuel Carrasco, I am a WIT committer as well as an Apache uh, member of the James Project, and I work for uh, Vadin. Yeah, that's a nice t shirt. Hi, I'm Jose Ignacio Dominguez, and I'm a Java web developer. Hi, I'm Jorge, I'm an unknown soldier. I'm Javier Zarzano. I work in Telefonica for Internet of Things projects, and I also hack at home. Yo, Jairo Amburger, Mac Spay or Madrid. Hi, I'm Diego. I'm a software developer in Auxentia. Hi, my name is Andres. I'm working with DigiBiz, I'm a Java EE developer. Hello, I'm Manuel Moreno. I'm Java developer. Hi, I'm Borja Lázaro. I'm Java developer in Authentia too. Hi, I'm Javier. I'm member of Makespace Madrid. Um, I'm an engineer and do all sorts of stuff. Cool. And we missed the, yeah. the background. Who wants this? Hi, I'm Alejandro Veliz, and I'm here to to watch uh, night hacking. Hi, I'm um, Javier Murcia. I'm a telecommunication student at the University of Alcalá. Hi, I'm Maria González, and I'm also a student. Hi, uh, I'm Jos Gavino from Telefónica. Hello, my name is Soraya Paniagua. I'm a journalist, and I write about that kind of things. Hi, I'm David Gomez. I'm one of the organizers of Madrid Jack. Also, I'm organizing one of the organizers of Conmusion, a big event in Spain. Also, a Java developer at, at Autentia. Mm, hi, uh, my name is Carlos, and I'm an electronic engineer and Java developer. Hello, I'm so you're, Jesus. You're behind the Hello, I'm Jesus Lopez de Uribe, from journalist and uh, from Fravelab León. 
Hello, I am Felipe Vea. I am from Peru. I am here on vacations. So I saw the meeting. I, I thought it was great to be here. Uh, I am a software developer uh, and I work in a startup in San Francisco. Cool. I'm Hi. the last one. I'm Cesar. I'm one of the co founders of MakeSpace. I'm also the organizer of Internet of Things Day. And I'm really happy to see so many people here and <laughs> have the event. No, thanks for opening the venue up. It's very nice. Very geeky venue here. That's good. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about Internet of Things with plenty of, of demos. So you guys, do you guys all like um, theme parks? Lots of good rides. So this is this is kind of like a like a theme park. So we're gonna we're gonna play with lots and lots and lots of toys. Oh, that's really badly cut off. All right, hold on a sec. <clears throat> Still badly cut off. About. That's even worse. <laughs> okay, let me put it back the way it was. And I think there must be some um, crop settings on the projector which are set incorrectly. Good, English, I can do this. Position. Oh, wonderful, we can. can move it. We can't shrink it. Hmm. <coughs> Maybe. Ah, oh, there we go. Shrink, shrink, shrink. All right, well, I think that's about the best it's going to get. Still cut off, but I can't do much more. Let's we'll see how bad it looks on the next slide. OK, so we're going to talk about some Legos, some development boards, like the Raspberry Pi. Um, I have a few other boards as well to show you guys. The Duke Pad, which is a homebrew tablet. So this is actually um, built using a laser cutter. Do you guys have a laser cutter? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we can, we can make more of these if we want. <laughs> um, and then some consumer tablets and devices. And, you know, briefly about the, the Internet of Things. So if you if you look at the trend towards, you know, people versus number of devices, um, the, it's predicted that by the time you get to um, 2015, you know, there will be three times as many devices as people. 2020, there will be five times as many devices as people and an explosive growth in terms of the number of connected devices. 
So devices that are talking to services and the internet and affecting different things like healthcare, um, home automation, and you know different things which you use in your daily life. How many folks have a cell phone on them today? Okay, so that's at least one internet connected device that everybody has and you probably didn't have 10 years ago. Um, so right now all these things kind of talk point to point to the internet and they often have proprietary protocols and cloud services and things that they communicate with. Um, but increasingly the trend is to have different devices interoperating and talking with each other to produce mesh networks and um, sensor grids and to get more value out of the devices than simply always hooking up to the internet. Um, so if you look at Java, traditionally on the left side is Java ME and the right side is, or, or rather the, um, the, the yellow and the light blue circle is Java ME APIs, CLDC and CDC. The big blue one is Java SE. Um, and the goal here, which came partway with the Java 8 release, is to converge Java ME and Java SE so you can use the same APIs on desktop to develop for embedded devices. Um, does anyone know the history of Java ME? A little bit? Okay, some of the Java guys should know this. But it, it was the primary use case historically has been using it on mobile devices. But the, um, the infrastructure they built for doing running and getting good performance on small devices talking with sensors like accelerometers and small devices uh, fits really well with embedded boards. So that's what they're positioning Java ME for now is doing embedded development. Um, and the goal is to have these converged where eventually Java ME will be a strict subset of Java SE. Okay, so that's, that's, all, the, that's all the theory I'm gonna give you guys. We're gonna do demos now. So the first demo I've got here, well, first of all, does anybody know who, the name of our mascot here? Duke, okay. <laughs> so this is the, the Java mascot, our buddy Duke, but um, he's made out of something different than a plush toy. So he's built from Legos. And inside of him, does anyone know what this set is? Here, let me help you. Very good. <laughs> this is the Lego Mindstorms EV3 set. And it's really nice because unlike the um, NXT and the RCX1, which preceded it, the Lego Mindstorms EV3 actually has a, a full ARM processor inside of it. So it has a TI Citara AM1808, which is a, an ARM 9 chip, 300 megahertz processor, which doesn't sound like much, but for embedded devices is actually quite good. Um, 64 megabytes of RAM, analog to digital converter. I'm hooking up the sensor and the motor ports now. Um, so it's quite a capable brick and it runs full, a full Java virtual machine. So the version of Java I've running on here is Java SE embedded and on the SD card I've installed Linux, um, Java SE embedded for Raspberry Pi and Lejos, which is a, um, open source project to access all the sensors and um, devices which hook up to the um, Lego Mindstorms from Java APIs. Okay, and then, you know, some of the motors he has on him. So if you notice the, we, he only has two legs here. So he's a, a little segue. He's gonna balance on two, on two legs. Um, those are using the large motors. <coughs> um, the small motor controls his arms. He also has a gyroscope inside of him, so we'd have to open him up to, 
to look at the gyroscope. That's how he tells his orientation and the angular acceleration. Um, he has a touch sensor in his hands, so that's how we'll start him. And then a color sensor in the other hand, which I have to think of something clever to do with, but at least he's balanced with two arms. Um, there's also, there's an ultrasonic sensor which comes with the educational kit. But what I'm using here is the infrared sensor. <coughs> they can both be used to test distance, although the infrared sensor is not as accurate. Um, doesn't detect as, as, um, as far and requires light in the room to do proximity detection. But it has the advantage that you can use a remote control together with it. Um, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to play with the remote control. So if you want to build an SD card from scratch, it's really easy. Um, there are instructions on the Lehouse website, but it takes you maybe an hour or two to download everything and get it up and running. Um, I'm using a Wi-Fi adapter here so we can talk to the network rather than a USB cable. And um, if you wanted to recompile the Lehouse libraries, that's some information about that as well. But you can just get the ev3classes.jar file and run with it which is what we're doing here. Um, this is what the code looks like for developing for Lehos. So if you've done any Java development, it's really straightforward. Um, just put a main, a main class or a main function in your primary class. Um, and then you can access the APIs using the Lehos classes. So this would draw on the LCD screen. And then when you want to deploy your application, you just copy the jar file over using secure copy and then um, execute it using SSH. OK, so we need some volunteers. Who's, who has kids? OK, so you, you know how to hold a baby, right? Yeah. OK, how many hands do you use to hold a baby? Here, think of this like your baby. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I need a, a second volunteer. Who, um, who's good at remote control cars or planes? <laughs> okay, here you go. So I'll, get, I'll tell you guys what to do. But first we have to start the program on him. Um, so the very first thing I need is I need you to read off the second IP address on his backpack. Yeah, Duke. Okay. So on, on his backpack, turn him around. There's two numbers there. What's the second number? The second one is 10015. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> All right, so now we're connected to, to Duke. So here's what's on him. Um, I already copied over some jar files with some programs. Um, so we're going to run the EV three-way program, which is a, just a segue algorithm. And um, once, once this starts loading, then we'll, we'll switch to Duke. Um, probably the, the easiest thing, maybe, because um, the camera can't move too far. Maybe you could do it in the center here. OK. So I'm going to nominate you to be the, the microphone guy. If, if these guys have anything to say, just okay. help them out. <laughs> and I'll give you instructions on, on what you need to do with our buddy, our buddy Duke. Let's switch to camera. OK, so you notice in Duke's hands, there's a button. Don't press it yet. Other, other, the other hand, don't, okay. but yeah, but don't press it. Okay, so um, first thing you want to do is lay him down on the ground on his back. On his back? Yeah. Okay, and make sure he's perfectly still. 
right? And now, now press the button. Now you want to pick them up. All right, so. <laughs> All right, so try again, but you, you have a timer, so you have five seconds oh, okay. to get him on his feet once he starts beeping. Oops. Okay, try one more time. Make sure he's perfectly still at the beginning. All right. Okay, so um, hold on a sec. We kill him. Here, don't don't try to put it back together because it will only make it worse. <laughs> See, this is the problem. If you were built out of Legos, you might have some problems too. Okay, so um, when you're putting him on his wheels, you need to try to get him as balanced as possible. So he'll stand up um, because he needs to be on his center of gravity. Hmm. That wasn't a good sound. Okay. So when you want, when you stand him up, right? Make sure he's balanced. Okay. In the center, right? Kind of like that. Yeah, good, Lekka. Um, okay. All right, let me restart the program. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, pick him up. Pick, pick him up with both hands, yeah. Now, don't, don't just pick him up. Hold him, hold him, hold, hold him in your hand. And the motors will reset in a sec. Okay, now lay him on his back. Yeah. Press the button in his hand. Okay, the motors aren't resetting. <laughs> okay, try one more time now. Now his motors have stopped, it'll be easier. All right, let go. Déjalo, déjalo, déjalo. All right. Oh, hold on. I, I killed the program again. Lay him on his back. Yeah. All right. So um, when you hear the, the last beep, right, he'll go beep, 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 yeah. then let go on the last beep. Okay. Let's make sure he's nice and... Ah, I see one brick missing. It's shaking around inside of him. Okay, try him again. Let go. Oh. Oops. Okay, so Duke, I, I don't think it's your problem. I think Duke is unhappy. <laughs> so when in doubt, power cycle him. We're going to shut him off and turn him back on, and we'll try him again in a little bit. And while we're waiting for Duke to reboot, we're going to try demo number two. Oh, I know why. So, <laughs> I, I plugged them up in the wrong order. So, um, yeah, that's why. That, that, that was on purpose, just to no. test me. Just to test you. <laughs> OK, this now. This is the the reason why yeah. the tube fell down. Yeah, yeah, because these were in the wrong order. Oh, <laughs> okay. They are the sensors. I numbered these. Um, let's see. Yeah, these are the these are the sensors. So I think probably one of these must be the gyroscope. And so he's not picking up the the right values. Okay. So he has to boot up again, and then we can try him okay. a second time. All right. So let's leave him here. Can you tell me when you um, see something different on the screen?
Y eso es cuando ya se lo dije. All right, so while we're waiting for Duke to reboot, we will skip to the next one, which is Raspberry Pi. So um, how many of you guys have a Raspberry Pi of your own? OK, so quite a few people in the room already have Raspberry Pi. It's a really good embedded device to start hacking on because it's fairly cheap, um, has a pretty good processor. It runs a um, Broadcom BCM 2835 processor, which is 700 megahertz. You can overclock it to about a gigahertz. And it's an ARM 11 chip, um, ARM version 6, but the processor is an ARM 11. Um, the Duke only has an ARM 9 chip in him. Um, and then you know you can power it via micro USB, use an SD card as a hard drive, and then hook it up to monitor, TV, uh, Duke's ready. Um, so Raspberry Pis are cool. We're going to do some demos on Raspberry Pis. Um, anyone know what those two ports on top are for on the Raspberry Pi? OK. Camera? Yeah, that's good. What? Screen. Yeah, OK, very good. All right, so you know a little bit about the Raspberry Pi. Um, yeah, so those, right now there's no screen which works with the Raspberry Pi because the Pi Foundation hasn't put out a screen, but they, you can use this screen um, as a replacement. It uses an LVDS panel which hooks up to the HDMI port and then gets touch events through USB. Um, and this is made by Chalkboard electronics. They have a 10-inch um, and also a 7-inch version. So this is the 7-inch screen we're going to play around with later on. Um, OK, and I think, what else do we have at Raspberry Pi? Uh, other boards, Java SE embedded, DukePad. OK, so let's do some demos. Um, so we're going to start with Lego Duke again. So grab Lego Duke. What's his IP address this time? The same one. Same one. OK, so I'm, I'm running the program on him. So try putting him on the ground again. So the, I, I think I have first it's OK. It doesn't do anything. OK, now same thing. Press the button in his hand and see if you can balance him quickly. Okay, much, much better. <laughs> All right, now let me explain how the remote control works. Um, who, who has the remote? I was making the movie. Sorry. No, it's okay. You, if you want to do the movie, then maybe he can use the remote while you're yeah, filming. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So the, the way the remote control works is um, each time you press the buttons, it makes them go faster. So just click it once or twice. Don't hold it in. Okay. Um, left, right, backwards, forwards, and this is stop. Backwards and yeah, forwards. Yeah. Good, Julie. Um, and the IR sensor is in his, uh, behind him. So if you stand behind okay. him, it'll be better. Sorry. So go, go behind the robot. Oh, okay. Behind. Try the turning. Does turning work? Come here. Come over here. Hey, you. Hey. 
<laughs> That's backwards you're pressing. Try turning. Try the top, top buttons. <laughs> He's barking. That's backwards you're pressing. That's forwards, yeah. I think he's shy. He's a shy guy. Yeah, he, he is. Oh, there he comes. Okay. Now try, try the top buttons. Try turning. Okay, so <laughs> too fast, but that's a good try. You want to try one more time? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go for it. All right, so sometimes the, on the second try, the IR sensor has some issues. So pick them up, and I'll reset the program quickly. Okay. Just grab them, yeah. Okay, now the program's restarting. Give it like 10 seconds, and then you can try it. Not quite yet. Uh, Okay, go for it. Press the stop button on the top if you want to slow him down or stop him. The big button, the top, top, that, okay. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Now he's stopped. Um, the IR sensor is behind him, so it's better to stand behind the robot. <laughs> Oops. Okay. All right, give him a round of applause. All right, so that's a quick example of what you can do with um, <coughs> Lego Mindstorms running Java on him. Um, you can find more information about how to do this on the Lehos website. Next thing we're going to look at is Raspberry Pi. So I have another demo application for the Raspberry Pi, and like you may guess, it also needs some volunteers to help out. So this is a Raspberry Pi on a, on a breadboard. Um, so this cable's hooked up, and it has a Pi cobbler hooked up to the breadboard. Um, there's an LCD panel on top of the Raspberry Pi we're going to use as output and then some sensors, a pressure sensor and a light sensor, which got horribly squished in my bag. But yeah, it looks like no wires are crossing too badly. Okay, so does anyone know the best way to power a Raspberry Pi? How do you power your Raspberry Pis at home? USB. USB? Connected to like a cell phone charger or cell phone charger. cell phone charger. Okay, this doesn't always work, but sometimes you can power it right off of a um, a laptop connection. If your laptop will give you about an amp of power, um, depends on the laptop how much power it actually wants to give you. 
And then how do you guys hook up to the Raspberry Pi to do stuff on it? How do you how do you work with the Raspberry Pi? HDMI hooked up to a screen? Yeah, okay, so this is headless. So what we're gonna do instead of hooking up to a screen is we're going to hook it up via ethernet to our computer here. And um, I'm gonna use internet connection sharing to set up a DHCP server that the Raspberry Pi can talk to. But if we had like a, you know, Ethernet hub or something, we could plug it into the Ethernet hub and talk to it that way, which is probably slightly easier. Um, once the Raspberry Pi comes online, I've set up Netatalk on it, so it'll show up in the Finder. That's Bonjour protocol for Mac. Um, but it is still blinking and booting, so I don't think it's quite on yet. Gonna try rebooting him one more time. Okay, now he has a happy activity light. Um, so the Raspberry Pi takes about um, 60 seconds or so to boot up. And then you can log into it via SSH and do stuff on the Raspberry Pi. Um, do you guys know how much memory the Raspberry Pi has on it? How much RAM? What? Depends. Depends. How about Model B? New, new second generation Model B. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> how about the Model A? Half, all right, very good. Oh, and I brought gifts for you guys, too, um, somewhere. So um, only folks who appear on the stream get stickers, so you guys all qualify. Um, so here, take some and pass them around. Okay, so always have backups available. I have a second Ethernet adapter we can try as well because the first one's not working.
All right, now we got a second either end adapter. Uh, I know it's talking. And it's unhappy. Okay, we're gonna try rebooting him one more time. Every time I hit him, I can see the, the lights flashing on the, on the Raspberry Pi. All right, and when one demo doesn't wanna work, start the next. <laughs> so the next thing I wanna show you guys is called the, the Duke Pad. Um, so unfortunately, it doesn't look as pretty as it used to. <laughs> but it's still fully functional. Even, even the touch screen works. Um, although I wouldn't recommend touching it because you're, um, you might get damaged. Um, so what the Duke pad is, is it's a Raspberry Pi so you can see it's actually got a Raspberry Pi in the back of the case, along with a USB hub and some other components. This is very um, homebrewish. Um, we built this in the, in the Java demo team to showcase JavaFX, which is a, a visual um, UI toolkit for programming with Java. And it works really well on embedded devices because it takes advantage of the the hardware acceleration, which is already present on most embedded devices. Um, okay. I, this guy used to be powered off of um, a battery, but in order to make it easier to show it to you guys, I replaced the battery with an HDMI splitter so we can put it up on screen whatever is on the display. Uh, okay, watch out for glass shards on the table. I think they're still flaking off after the damage. Okay, so he's booting. And I'm gonna put exactly the same screen up here. So you can see the, the initially had a Linux load screen because it's running um, Raspbian, the Debian variants of Linux used with the Raspberry Pi. And now it's loading the JavaFX user interface, which is the the tablet UI that you can use to control everything. And um, you can't see in the top left corner, but it's now listing all of the OS OSGI modules, <coughs> which make up the different applications which are deployed. So normally, like if you have an iPad or an Android tablet, right, you install IPA or APK files. The way you install applications into this is simply via a um, dropping jar files that are OSGI bundles. Okay, so I'm gonna attempt to do this without cutting my finger too badly. Okay, <laughs> now we're logged in. Um, 
Here's an example of a JavaFX game. If I can get it to, there we go. Fossil game, so you're trying to get you know three in a row. Uh, I'm not very good at this game, as you can see. Oh, combos and bombs. I'm good at making bombs blow up. Mm -hmm. I would ask you guys to play the game, but I don't want anyone to risk hurting themselves on the um, cracked screen. Oh, almost there. OK, so level completed. So you can see the performance is pretty good on the, on the Duke pad. Um, you can also do 3D with this. So JavaFX has 3D APIs. Here's a 3D cube. And you can do media. Some days. So what do you guys want to see? You want to see um, the Java 1 trailer or you want to see Iron Man? Java 1 trailer. Java 1 trailer. <laughs> Good. That's the right answer. OK, so this is the Java 1 movie from two years ago? Two or three years ago. I can't remember which. Um, with you know some of the finest rapping um, coders. I don't think any of the guys who played actors in this role are actually coders, though. They're just actors. And we would have sound as well if you know we plugged up. There's a, an audio port on that for getting sound out of the Raspberry Pi. Um, but as you can see, the Raspberry Pi has really good performance for um, video processing. This is an H.264 encoded video, and it you know, <laughs> works great on the Raspberry Pi. The, oh, the UI toolkit used? Yeah, it's JavaFX. Yeah. Which it comes with, um, starting with Java 8, it comes with the standard Java release. So you can just, you know, just like Swing or the other previous UI toolkits, AWT, you can just write JavaFX without any special downloads or jars. OK, so DukePad. I'm going to leave it on, but show you a little bit about how he was designed. Ah, oh, so OK. Now our, our demo's working. We can go back and do this demo. And I, 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 this happened once before where I couldn't connect to my computer. And I tried a couple of different things, but I couldn't figure out what finally made it work. Um, but apparently, the secret is rebooting this machine. <laughs> OK, so let me, let me show you some screenshots of the Duke pad. And then we'll go back and we'll do this demo. Um, so here's the, the Duke pad. Right? It's, this is the 3D mock-up of, of how it's designed. Um, so that's actually the stacked cases and the components and a 3D rendering. Um, this is on the laser cutter when we took the big sheet of plastic and then etched out the design. So we have the files online as PDF and um, CAD files if we want to try to print it out on a 3D printer or the laser cutter here. Um, you also you need to get the right thickness acrylic as well. It's very to get the right sandwiching. You need the right thickness to make everything work. Um, it has a USB hub in it, um, an LVDS panel, the same one for chalk electronics I mentioned earlier. 
battery. Here's it being assembled bit by bit. That's almost complete. What's that missing? Ah, okay, so that's, yeah, that's almost everything except the battery. And there's Gary, who's one of the demo guys, and also um, he does all the testing of new embedded boards for the Java team as well. So he's a cool guy. Um, and you can actually find the schematics on the um, DukePad website. Um, you can't see the URL because it's in the top right and the projector is cut off horribly, but it's um, j.mp slash DukePad. Okay, now you can see it right here. So if you go to that website, it has all the files, the software is open source, the hardware components are all things you can buy off the shelf. Um, so other than some soldering and the laser cutting, there's not really a lot that you need to custom build. Like you don't need to custom do any chipsets or anything crazy. Okay, so demo time again. Mm -hmm. So we got our, our buddy here, right? And now we're properly hooked up to him on the computer over here, because if we look in the finder, we can see that the device is showing up, LCD test board. And that's not the terminal. Uh. Okay, so now I'm SSHing, since he has a, a local name, we can actually SSH directly to the board. Um, to do stuff on him. And I, I built some sample applications with Gary's help to test out the, um, the analog to digital converter. And um, Pi, we're using the Pi4j library. So Pi4j is a um, open source library that lets you access the different GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi to integrate with hardware sensors. So we're going to run the Pi plate sensors demo. And I'm going to need um, some help from a volunteer. Who wants to volunteer? You, you held the mic last time. How about you? You can do it this time. So the way this works is, as you can see on the, the Pi, We're getting the, 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 well, the bottom number on the screen, but the top number is the force. That's how much pressure is being applied to the pressure sensor. And the bottom one, the photo, tells you how much light is getting on the photo cell sensor here. So let's see how strong the mix space and Madrid jug are. Squeeze, squeeze this as hard as you can without yanking it off the, the board. Okay, so we got 14, 90, oh, 15, 15, 10, 15. I can get that diary already. All right, all right, that's good. <laughs> all right, very good. Some, some of the user groups can only get up to 1,400, so that was good effort. And see how low you can get the, <laughs> see how low you can get the photo cell sensor by covering it. You can touch it, it's okay to, okay. 40, 30, 20s. 23, 22. Okay, so we're in the 20s, not too bad. So, so you guys are stronger, but not as good at blocking light. <laughs> All right, so that's just a quick example of what you can do with the GPIO on the Raspberry Pi. I think if you're, if you're gonna use a Raspberry Pi, really the, the thing to do is play with GPIO and do hardware projects with it, because otherwise it's just a computer if you're not interacting with other hardware devices. Um, now, I have some other boards um, with demos that are in various incomplete states. So I'm going to show you the boards, and later on we can, we can play and hack around with the boards if you want to. Um, 
Let's see. Okay. So here, uh huh. Let me get a good camera shot of it. Okay, this is the Jamalto bubble board, uh, or now they call it their development board, concept board. Concept board is their new name. Um, but the cool thing about this is it's it's larger than the Raspberry Pi and has more you know sensors and things on it, but the actual chip is really tiny. And on the chip, it's um, essentially a, you you can mount this on um, other development boards. And it gives you a um, Cortex M processor, I think it's an M3 equivalent. Um, plus it has a um, 3G antenna on it as well. So you can hook up to the cell network. And here's the SIM card slot for the SIM, I believe. Yeah, that looks like a funky slot. Um, so. That's one board. This runs Java ME. Um, all right, I have a second board here. This one I have a demo working on that used to work. And then I, um, when I was at Garrett's place, I decided to throw it across the room for some reason. And now the demo doesn't work as well as it used to. <laughs> Um, but this is a Udo board. And um, the nice thing about this guy is, does anyone have a, um, like a cell phone with a light on it? Light? Or could you just hold mine? Here, because it's, we don't have quite enough light, but if you shine a little light on the board, it'll be easier to see. Yeah. How's that? Better? Okay. So this um, big heat sink is where the processor is. It's, it's like a Raspberry Pi, but it's an ARM version 7 chip. Um, um, it's an IMX6 chip, it's quad core, one gigahertz. And it has a Atmel chip, which is kind of like an Arduino. This is Arduino compatible. And an Arduino shield for the pins. So it's compatible with different Arduino devices if you want to hook them up directly. And you can use the Atmel chip for analog and the Raspberry Pi for digital and kind of get the best of both worlds um, by communicating over a little serial bus that's built into this. So this is a cool board. And the last board I want to show you guys, um, here it is. OK, so this guy. is a board from Boundary Devices, which is also an IMX6 board. There we go. And this is the, the new board which we're, um, we're looking at for doing a lot of our demos internally. Um, so again, it's kind of like a, a souped up Raspberry Pi. This is either dual or quad core, I can't remember which. Um, and has connectivity for LCD displays, um, you can hook up a SATA drive to it. So a whole bunch of cool stuff you can, you can do with this board as well. So we have lots and lots of hardware to play around with. Um, thank you. OK, so while we have this out, um, there's something else I want to show you guys that you might not know about. So does anyone? You know, you, know, you know what this is, right? <laughs> iPhone. But I bet you didn't know that Java runs on this. Or more specifically, JavaFX. So I have a, an application here. And it's the um, fish sim example from Java 1. So it starts up fairly quickly. Um, and you can run full JavaFX on the iPhone. Oh, that was a bad sound. Excuse me. 
Anyone know what this is? Okay, close, but Google, not Microsoft. Is this a Chromebook? What? Is this a Chromebook? No. Here, get closer. Look. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it's the ASUS Transformer Prime. Okay, that's okay. We're, we're gonna, we have more demos to show. So I'm gonna get them close to the camera. Um, how about this? Okay, close. It's kind of like the Galaxy Gear, but it's made in China and it has a faster processor. But it's an Android, it's an Android watch, CG PAX. Um, so we'll start, we'll start with our, our buddy, the ASUS Transformer Prime. And we're gonna we're gonna try Mimi Quest, which is a game that Johan Voss wrote. Johan Voss is the one who's supporting the open source um, JavaFX port to Android, um, and this does require a network. So hopefully it will hook up to the the network hub in the room here. Let me check. Yeah. Okay. We're on the network. Okay, so um, unfortunately, Johan Voss is, is not the best designer. He's very good at hacking, very, not very good at graphics. So this, this is his very fanciest graphics design work. <laughs> um, okay, so, and then he asks you questions. What's required for making JavaFX the top RIA platform with a little talking smiley? 3D capabilities are promising. This can be a huge differentiator. Performance is extremely important. So what do you guys think? Is 3D important to make JavaFX successful? Yeah, okay. <coughs> a little smiley. All right, next. Distribution is the key. It should be extremely easy for end users to install and execute a JavaFX, a JavaFX application as visiting a web page. What do you guys think, distribution? Okay, nobody cares. Yeah. Uh, a developer community. You need a good developer community with more applications and more folks using it. What do you think? Yeah? This is a community space, right? Okay. Big happy. And we're done. Okay. So just a quick example. It talks via back-end Java web service in an Amazon cloud, so it's deployed to the cloud. It's a Java FX application running on the tablet here. Um, and you can do much cooler graphics than this. Um, okay, that's a good question. Use the mic. Okay. Uh, the question is, how is JavaFS running on Android? Have you compiled the, the JavaFS application to Dalvik or have you rooted the device and installed a virtual machine? Yeah, okay, machine? so the, the, the device is not rooted, um, and neither is the iOS device, or I should say it doesn't need to be rooted. <laughs> <laughs> but um, basically the way it works is you, you use the normal Dalvik compiler, so you compile to Dalvik bytecodes for Java 7, but in addition you include the open JFX libraries for the graphics. And that writes directly to the 3D graphics on the device. So for the end user, it looks like a normal application, right? You just get the APK file and deploy it to the device. Or you could you know, put it in the Google Store and then have people, or the Play Store and have people install it. Um, but as a developer, you can code the entire application in Java. You don't need to, um, um, well, you can code it in JavaFX. You don't need to use the Android UI classes to do the coding. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yep. And what about iOS? Uh, do you, what about the iOS? Do you have uh, a JVM in iOS? Or, or okay, that's a good question as well. Um, probably that's better answered by looking at the, um, the slide I prepared. Um, so it's compiled using RoboVM, 
which is a cross compiler. So this takes your Java bytecodes and cross compiles them to native um, iOS codes. So there's no JVM required. And since it's doing ahead of time compilation, it's quite fast. Like startup time is fast, performance on device is fast. It's pretty indistinguishable from a native application. And, and is it approved by Apple? Um, so there's both precedence for um, Apple allowing third party frameworks. If you play any games on the iPad, most of those games are not written in Objective-C. People are using third-party frameworks. It's mostly 3D code plus third-party frameworks and glue to hold it together. Um, and there's already a number of applications, about um, 20 or 30, which have been deployed using RoboVM to the store. Um, so, you know, there's not an endorsement from Apple. They don't usually endorse anybody. <laughs> <laughs> But it's not forbidden by their terms of service, and there's plenty of other people who are doing this. Um, and then for the Android stuff, um, this is the, the website for the Android um, port, which Johan's working on. And of course, you can't see the URL, but there it is. Um, it's bitpucket.org slash JavaFX port slash Android slash wiki slash home. Um, and it's the same code base, so it's based on OpenJFX, which is the open source JavaFX version that's part of OpenJDK. But this is specifically designed to fill some of the gaps with Android, like accessing the, the hardware sensors and allowing you to do stuff, run stuff in the background, and you know, do all the things with Android which um, you need, aren't normally supported on desktop. Is there a version for uh, browser? Okay, so if you want to run JavaFX in the browser, you can use applets, or you can use WebStart that's not in the browser, but it launches from the browser. Um, but what I'd recommend for desktop, if you, if you have the choice, is to use um, packaged applications. JavaFX and Java 8 has new packaged application support, and that lets you bundle up the um, where did I leave the watch? Oh. It's impossible to to use the screen like a search Google. Crazy. Yeah. So it's a it's a very tiny touch screen. <laughs> Can you use the voice like interface with the watch? It has well, it has a camera on it, oh, so you can do face. You can do like um, video conferencing, like Skype. And um, even though it's tiny, the most of the user interface is designed with large icons, so you can get through most of it. Um, just don't try to get on a Wi-Fi network and type your WPA2 password. That's, that's a challenge. OK, so um, you know, that's the Android port of the same thing. And I, I didn't show this before, but uh, my little Android watch here has a JavaFX application deployed that was designed by Garrett Grunwald. So this is called Clock 2. And it, it shows the time as text in different languages. That's German, <coughs> English, uh, Acht, Neun, that looks like Dutch, Vino, Sino. Are we French? <clears throat> Dos, siete, this is probably Spanish, cinco. I think we made it to Spanish. Okay, and you can change the, the color. <coughs> That's impossible to see, okay. So yeah, so the camera likes black and white the best. And you can also change it to have a visual view with numbers rather than words. <coughs> so. You know, just a simple JavaFX application, which you know runs really well on um, Android devices and watches as well as tablets. Um, so you can pass this around if people want to take a look at that. All right. So you, you guys are you guys are probably thinking that like almost all my bags are empty and I've probably shown everything, but that's not true. I save the best for last. 
So my last bag has a um, our little French robot who just got a name yesterday. So his name is now Quava, which I learned is um, was it Georgian for coffee? I don't know. Shar on Twitter, he's he's the old uh, evangelism boss. He um he named him. <clears throat> okay, so this guy is the now robot made by Aldebaran Robotics, which is a French robot maker. He has, I believe, twenty six motors to control all of the joints in him. <laughs> Um, various sensors as well. So um, on his head, he has tactile sensors. So you can touch his head in different places and he can, um, you know, for yes, no, if you want to. Um, on his chest, he has um, proximity sensors, kind of like the Lego proximity sensor I mentioned for obstacle avoidance. So he can try to try to avoid crashing into things. He also has bumpers on his feet, which serve a similar purpose if he shuffles into something and you can't see it. Um, on his head, he has two cameras, one forward-facing camera and one down-facing camera. Um, they added the down-facing camera to specifically support um, playing sports, like kicking balls and things. Um, the ears are um, speakers, and there's a microphone here, so he can um, listen and talk. Um, a button here. Um, the eyes are infrared, so they can pick up infrared remotes. Um, his hands have little grippers, so they just have a you know open close mechanic. Um, I forget anything. Well, oh, he, you know he has a bunch of gyroscopes all over him, um, so he can tell his balance and move around. So the the now robot. Um, we're going we're gonna to play around with him a bit, but there's a few different ways you can interact with him and control him. Um, um, so it's made by Aldebaran Robotics. They're, they're in Paris. Aldebaran. A L D. <laughs> yeah. um, so there's a few different ways you can program him. There's a visual programming environment called Choreograph, which um, comes with the robot and is made by Aldebaran. So I'll show you guys that, and that's a good way to get started. Um, but you can also program to him using direct programming languages. So the core APIs are written in C, but they have wrapper APIs in Python and Java and a whole bunch of different languages. Um, so right now he's, he's executing a program called Now Life. And he's, um, he's going to kind of look around for things in his field of vision. Um, so if you try to get in front of him, right? Okay. So he'll kind of he'll kind of try to look at your face, and then he should kind of follow your face. Okay, maybe he's not seeing me. Well, the best way to to see what now is seeing is we can actually connect to them via choreograph, and then we'll get a camera view of whatever he's currently looking at once we're connected. Maybe. Ah, oh, okay. 
So this, my, my computer decided to freeze for some reason. But once it comes back to life, we should, we should be able to see exactly what now is seeing. And this is the choreograph software in the center. You drop in boxes to um, give them different commands and you can chain them together using visual flow diagrams, um, deploy it to directly to the robot over Wi-Fi and test stuff out quickly. And you can also package them up as applications. They have a little app store for the Now robot. So you can build apps or try other people's apps on the Now robot. Okay, so. Force quit. And we will try again. Having only the, the finest luck with demos today. <laughs> huh. Is he still moving? Yeah, he's still awake. Oh, okay. All right, so um, you can see there's a view of his camera, what he's trying to look at. And we get in front of him. Oh, I bet it's a light, light issue. Uh, where are the lights coming from? Come over here. Hey. Okay, now you should. Look around, yeah. So he's trying to follow my face a little bit. All right, and he'll also walk around a bit if we get him to stand up. So, let's make our buddy now stand up. I'm going to drop in some items into Choreograph. Oh, there, now he's looking at the ceiling. So there's a bunch of different built-in boxes for you know saying things. So we can get him to say hello to you guys. Well, that's good enough. Okay, that was not very loud. Increase his volume and try again. Okay, so he did a little animated say. And we can also make him stand up. Oh, motion, wake up, stand up. Okay, so now he's standing, um, and he should, he should do a little shuffle now when he's following faces with the Animated Life program. Okay, come on, walk this way. Yeah. Oh. Okay, he doesn't like me. Why don't you try? <laughs> No, no, he doesn't like you either. Now he's looking at you. <laughs> Yeah, he's got a good shot of your face on the screen. So he is, he is tracking your face. All right, well, let's, let's make him walk around. So I'm gonna add in an obstacle avoidance algorithm. 
And um, let's move him to the ground so he has more room to walk around. And he should, we'll take this out too. He should walk around and whenever he tr bumps into something, he'll try to um, reposition and walk around them. So apparently, you can easily walk under tables and over cords. Ah. Ouch. <laughs> All right, so he, you notice he, he noticed once he was um, about to fall down. So the now robot's pretty smart. He'll um, protect himself when he falls. And then when we rerun the program again, he'll get up from this position. So I'm going to pull the cord out of the way. And he should be able to stand up from pretty much any position. Might be hitting Wi-Fi range issues. Because <laughs> the computer is just kind of sitting there and waiting for him. Oops. Stateless removed. So whenever you pick them up, always remove the, um, the motor stablers. So it's safe to move him around. Otherwise, his joints are stiff and they tend to overheat. OK. All right, now we're hooked up to him again. I think it was a Wi-Fi range issue. And we'll try running again. I think this, um, for some reason he's not picking up this, um, he's not noticing that's in front of him. So this time um, try to block him, like get in front of him and see if you can block him a little bit. Okay, so his obstacle avoidance is not very happy at all. He was happily avoiding stuff yesterday. Come on. Stateless removed. All right, well, uh, let's try the next trick. Come on now. So first we're gonna plug him in because his battery life is about half an hour. Not nearly long enough. And then I mentioned we can hook up to him via Java as well. So I'm going to switch over to IntelliJ. 
and then see if we can run a program on him directly. All right, so um, here's a Java programming environment. And um, well, <coughs> here you can see a really simple application to run on the now. So we're going to hook up to them over um, Wi-Fi. Um, then we're going to cook up the text-to-speech service. And then say, hello, night hackers. How do you like the Madrid mix space? Um, <laughs> make sure we have the right IP address. 10.0.1.3. Uh-huh, 10.0.1.7. And we'll give this a try. Okay, and the next program is a little more complicated, but this one takes a picture of you guys. Okay, so I ran it a couple I'm going times. To take a photo. One, two, Actually, three, ran it three smile. times. Okay, and then you can see on the screen here. Here's our Sending our picture. All three of them came at the same time. So you can take the camera inputs from Java. Um, script them up using Java or other languages and do more complex interactions with the robot. Okay, so that's a little bit about the, the now robot. And now, now I really am out of demos. <laughs> so I'll mention a few things in closing and then we can do whatever you guys want to do. So one is, um, are any of you guys Java Mag subscribers? Okay, so if you're not, check out Java Magazine. It's a good way to, to learn about um, different things in Java 8. This has um, articles on, the March-April issue has articles on lambdas and NASHORN and date and time and embedded Java. What I've been showing is mostly embedded Java. Um, we also have a developer challenge going on. So you can one of, win one of nine passes to Java 1. Um, the deadline is May 30th, and you submit at java.net slash challenge. All you have to do is build a, a Java project using Raspberry Pi. Um, let me know once you're done taking pictures of the slide. Good. And the last thing I want to mention is um, Java 1 San Francisco. So I'm the conference chair for Java 1, and it's uh, the, the biggest Java conference in the world. Um, the call for papers is open till May 15th, or April 15th. So you have a few days <laughs> to get in a talk if you'd like to submit. Um, and there's also a really good discount going on right now. So there's a super saver award, and in addition to that, that's 
600 off, and you get an extra 200 off using the Java 8 promo code, um, which I'll put on my blog shortly. So if you follow my blog at steveonjava.com, you can, you can get a pretty good price for the conference as well. OK, and then some contact information for me. So the, um, the video we've been recording will be on nighthacking.com, and you can watch other, other videos and streams I'm doing there. And then that's my blog, steveonjava.com, and my Twitter handle. All right, so I'm going to turn it back over to Caesar. Yeah. There's a mic. Okay. <clears throat> what are we doing, Fearless Leader? I, I don't know how many of you have laptops or want to hack some of this stuff or try it around or learn more about something of this stuff. I don't know. What's your plan for today? <laughs> Be serious till we leave. <laughs> okay. I think, I, I don't know. Uh, the, the only thing I have to say is, like I said for the people that just came later, uh, we make our first anniversary on next Tuesday, the ending date for the presentation. So if you submit something, you still have the afternoon to come here and <laughs> enjoy an open door day. So, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you uh, if you were involved in that project or not. There used to be a embedded uh, project at uh, Sun at the time, which was Sunspot. Yeah. Where is that, or what's the status of that project? Is it close? Is it evolving um, somewhere? Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, the Sunspot was a a small embedded, um, I guess, component. It was actually it was 3D printed at the Sun offices, now, now Oracle offices. Um, it, it had a small processor in it which could run, um, what was the name of the language? Start with a K, I think. Okay, but it was, a, it was a variant of Java designed for embedded devices with its own VM. Um, it had a bunch of sensors on it, like an accelerometer, um, Wi-Fi connectivity, um, yeah, you community and temperature sensors. Um, so you, I'm not sure if it was Wi-Fi. They talked to each other. They were using Yeah, yeah, no. They, so it wasn't Wi-Fi. They talked to each other. Like there was a base, a base one, and then you could have a bunch of them and, and a sensor network communicating. Was it Bluetooth? I don't know. Six slope. Six slope. Yeah, okay, that sounds right. You, you know more about this than I do. I <laughs> Yeah, so um, from a, it's, it was really cool, but from like a hardware perspective, it's now, like, I don't know, six years later or however many years after the initial release, it's, it's probably outdated from a hardware perspective. Uh, most of the, the new developments going into embedded boards, and you could actually build similar things using, um, for example, the chipset and the Jamalto board there, a Cortex-M3, or um, similar low-power chips, um, and probably have it be a little bit more standard using Java ME, rather than the special embedded processor they used for, um, for the hotspot. But I don't know the details about internally what they're doing with the hotspot team or whether they're planning future revisions. Um, so if you're interested, I can put you in touch with the... Yeah, yeah. I think, but I think that, that using Java ME on small devices is kind of the future. Um, it's more standard. Okay, so if there are any other questions, like I'll, I'll keep the demos out and we can play with demos. Or if anyone wants like a hardware project they want to fiddle around with, then we can play with some of the um, boards or at some point, so I, I drove all day, so at some point I need to get food too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have cover. <laughs> so, yeah. Whatever you want. We are ready. We so, yeah, I know. Don't be shy, please. <laughs> so, um, 
I don't know, take your laptops and do stuff. Eh? <laughs> Whatever. Feel free just to try the demos. I, I, this clock is really fun to check. I, I don't say anything about it. Really fun, really surreal experience, really. Well, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end the stream. Thanks, everyone, Thank for joining us online.